When it was proven that this bomb could pass through thick and heavy reinforced concrete walls and explode on the other side, underground shelters known as bunkers immediately became obsolete. No thick reinforced concrete walls could prevent or stop a successive attack of these bombs, even underground nuclear shelters. These shelters, built to host very important people such as presidents, were not considered completely safe against this type of bomb, which was continuously being improved and refined, and which could even count the flaws as it passed through the interior of the structure and explode at a predetermined depth. But as in every war, when the best strategy is found, it does not take long before a better way to neutralize it is also discovered. In this case, it was always a contest between improvements to the bomb's technology and improvements to the bunker's construction. This time, however, it seems that underground shelters are ahead with the emergence of a new type of concrete. For a bunker buster to be able to pass through a set of walls of reinforced concrete, a lot of science is involved. But everything revolves around two principles, hardness and strength. Hardness of the weapon, in the sense of being able to penetrate the concrete, and strength of the concrete, in the sense of withstanding the force or impact applied to it while maintaining its structural integrity. It is important to be careful with the word hardness, because hardness is a very well-defined concept in material science. One way to define and evaluate the hardness of a material is through its ability to penetrate another material. To better understand what hardness is, let us take the example of diamond, the hardest mineral found in nature. It can scratch glass, quartz, sapphire, ruby, and all other minerals, but it can only be scratched by another diamond. It is because of this characteristic that diamonds are used in some blades and saws to cut stone. But although diamonds have the highest hardness, they are not, by far, the strongest. In other words, although they are hard, they are not strong, and they break easily. Newton himself proposed an approximate equation to calculate the penetration depth of a projectile moving at high speed, considering only momentum. Simply put, the theory says that the greater the density of the penetrating projectile relative to the target, the deeper the projectile will go. Of course, the theory disregards some important parameters, such as the hardness and strength of the impacted material, as well as what happens to the kinetic energy dissipated on impact. For example, a Kevlar bulletproof vest may be hit by a denser projectile, and, in theory, that projectile should pass through the vest. But in practice, Kevlar can completely stop the bullet without its fibers breaking. However, if the bullet is made of a much harder steel, it will pass through Kevlar more easily. If the vest is made of plates of an even harder material, the impact may cause the projectile to disintegrate. But if tungsten is placed at the tip of the bullet, the plates may shatter on impact, because although they are hard, they are not harder than tungsten. Penetrating walls using bombs specially designed for that purpose is not just about speed and impact force. The material the bomb is made from makes all the difference in the impact and in ensuring it can pass through thick reinforced concrete walls while remaining practically intact after passing through. During the Second World War, these concepts were not well understood. It was believed that for a bomb to penetrate soil or thick concrete walls, it simply needed to be extremely large, heavy, and made from a material that could withstand the impact. This is how the Grand Slam bomb was created. The Grand Slam was the largest bomb used in the Second World War. It weighed 10 tons, measured 8 meters in length, and had a diameter of just over 1 meter. Dropped by a bomber, it had a small rocket motor in its tail that increased its falling speed to about 1,600 kilometers per hour. Its impact was so powerful that it could pierce 6 meters of reinforced concrete or 40 meters of soil before exploding. One of its main characteristics was using the kinetic energy of the impact to propagate powerful shock waves underground, severely damaging any nearby structure, including underground targets. But in the 21st century, we have the GBU-28, weighing just 2.2 tons, 
with a much thinner and more compact design, with 40 centimeters in diameter and 5.7 meters long. The GBU-28 can pierce 6 meters of reinforced concrete or 30 meters of soil. Its longer and thinner design allows it to concentrate all kinetic energy into a smaller point, making it easier to penetrate concrete. And it is worth remembering that the concrete these bombs must pass through is not the same used in ordinary buildings. It is a much harder, stronger and lab-modified concrete, capable of withstanding not only large impacts, but also high compressive loads. Only two GBU-28 bombs were used during operations against so-called impenetrable bunkers. Although the newer, thinner, more compact bunker buster designs have advantages, one cannot underestimate the penetration and destruction power of older, heavier, larger diameter bomb designs. If a bunker's structure is hit directly by a very heavy, large diameter, high hardness and high speed bomb, the impact power and shock will be so intense that in addition to piercing the wall, they could propagate powerful waves capable of compromising the building's structural integrity. That is why the Massive Ordnance Penetrator, or MOP, exists. Introduced in 2013, with 14 meters in length, 80 centimeters in diameter, and two tons of explosives. It is the largest bomb in its category. Both the MOP and the Grand Slam are made from a steel known as Eglin steel, a high-performance, extremely strong steel developed by the United States Air Force. This steel contains low carbon, low nickel, and traces of tungsten, chromium, magnesium, vanadium, among others, all contributing to the alloy's incredible strength. In fact, Eglin steel is more than six times stronger than the steel used to build buildings. All very impressive. Until early 2008, when something curious happened. The bomb was tested, and upon hitting a bunker, became embedded in the concrete surface without passing through it. Somehow, inexplicably, it was stopped, catching American analysts by surprise. The reason for this is that Iran is a leader in developing something known as UHPC, or Ultra High Performance Concrete. UHPC is not just a new type of concrete. In fact, specialists have turned it into a composite material. It uses regular cement, supplementary cementitious materials, quartz flour, among others, plus 1% high carbon fibers, glass fibers, or a combination of these. This works so well that UHPC has extremely high levels of durability, toughness, and hardness. To give you an idea, the compressive strength of UHPC before fracturing is much higher than that of regular concrete, which ranges between 20 and 25 megapascals. Because of this concrete and continuous improvements to its formula, the MOP was updated four times before even entering operation. While the MOP can penetrate up to 61 meters in standard reinforced concrete structures, this number drops to only 8 meters in bunkers made from specially lab-modified concrete and to about 2 meters in structures made from UHPC. When a piece of concrete is struck with great force, two scenarios are possible. The first one is the concrete breaks completely. This happens because concrete is very good at withstanding static loads, but is brittle when faced with sudden impacts. And the second scenario is the concrete absorbs all the impact energy without breaking. In this case, if the concrete is very strong and thick, it can stop the projectile without spreading cracks. One of the fatal flaws of regular concrete lies in its intolerance to large impacts and how easily cracks form and propagate from the impact zone. This is where UHPC engineering comes in. The added fibers, besides increasing hardness, help prevent crack propagation and structural compromise. In addition, UHPC is very dense, making penetration even more difficult. Although this new type of concrete significantly reduces the penetration power of current bombs, bunkers remain a threat because there are many modifications that can be explored and made to the bomb to increase its piercing ability. In fact, Dr. Schneider, 
who helped develop the GBU-28's penetrating tip, wrote his PhD thesis on how different arrangements of a metal's grains can increase its resistance to deformation. This is because, in general, materials are hard or strong in some directions and weak in others. Possible improvements include bombs made from tungsten, depleted uranium, or an alloy of both. These improved designs with greater speed at impact all increase penetration energy. However, today, this type of bomb is nearing the end of its days, at least in its current forms. The trend is for bunkers to be built increasingly deep underground, which, combined with physical limits on launch and penetration power, may make this type of weapon insufficient. One example is an Iranian missile bunker built at a depth of 500 meters. Remember that the MOP can pierce, at most, about 61 meters of soil. Another way to protect a bunker is to destroy the missile before it ever arrives using interception systems. But intercepting a missile traveling faster than a rifle bullet, with only seconds to react, is a completely different battle. Every fraction of a second matters. The margin for error is almost zero. Yet there are systems that can detect, track and destroy these missiles in mid-flight, often before anyone on the ground even knows they exist. Click this video to uncover how Russian missiles are stopped in real combat and why it's one of the most difficult feats in modern warfare.